Hey everybody, how you doing? Shula Ruler here. Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, what we're going to take a look at is properly downsizing a neutral conductor according to 4-018 in the 2018 version of the Canadian Electrical Code. It's not a common application, but it's good to have a little bit of a guided hand when we're working through it. We'll take a look at what we can apply a demand factor to and what we can't apply a demand factor to. <laughs> So as mentioned in the introduction, we're going to be looking at 4-018 in the 2018 version of the Canadian Electrical Code to properly downsize our neutral. If you look at the circuit that we have drawn to the left here, it's an Edison three-wire circuit. We have a center-tapped coil that provides us with 120 volts, um, giving us that single-phase three-wire 120-240 volt circuit. So that would be our supply, would be 120-240 volt, right? And each one of those 120 volt circuits supplies a 500 amp load. So the first step that we need to do, step one, we need to determine what is the maximum unbalanced load. So max unbalanced load. If we think about what the job of a neutral is, it stabilizes those voltages. If we remove that neutral, everything would be fine in this situation. But if we were to throw an imbalanced load in there, that you would see the voltage of that 240 volt coil separate proportional to the impedance of each one of those loads. Uh, we're not focused on that today. What we're looking at is the job of the neutral where it is intended to carry the unbalanced load. So in this case here, if we look at this, we have essentially 500 amps coming in on line one. At our neutral junction, we have 500 amps required by our load on line two as well. So really, flowing down our neutral, in this case, we should see zero amps. Nothing is required at that junction. Just like back here, we have 500 amps returning to our supply and we have 500 amps exiting our supply, which means, again, there's no current flowing on that neutral. So both the front and the back end of the circuit can prove what's happening on the neutral. In this case, it's zero. So the determining the maximum unbalanced load, that is not the maximum unbalanced load. What the maximum unbalanced load is kind of like if we look at it as a worst case scenario. What could potentially happen in this circuit? If we were to suddenly break this conductor right here, our line two conductor, we would no longer be supplying that 500 amp load because it's an open circuit in that 120 volt circuit. We would still, however, be supplying the 500 amp load off of line one, which now means that our current on our neutral is no longer zero. It's actually the return path for our circuit. It now becomes more like an identified conductor, and we would see 500 amps on that neutral now. So in this example, 500 amps would be the maximum unbalanced load. Really, when you look at it, it's what is the largest that that neutral could potentially see if either of those other circuits were to open, right? So let's take a look at this with an unbalanced situation. So we'll connect this back up. We'll get rid of our loads and we'll fire on some different values here. We'll keep it fairly simple. Let's say we have a 300 amp load. Get rid of those two. We have a 300 amp load and we'll say here we have a 400 amp load. So again, just kind of plotting what's happening with the current. We have 300 amps coming out on line one. We have 400 amps returning on line two. At this junction right here, if I have 300 here and I require 400 here, it means that on my neutral, instead of in the last example, we had zero. It means at this junction, I require 100 amps. And again, we can prove it by looking at the back end of the circuit and saying, well, if I have 400 amps here and 300 amps here, it means that obviously we are dropping off 100 amps, right? And Kirchhoff's volt or current law rather, right? That 100 amps travels down and that becomes the extra 100 amps. It's just a, a circuit, right? It continues. So again, this 100 amps that's on the neutral currently, that is not the maximum unbalanced load. What that is, is just the neutral current in this example. The maximum unbalanced load would be, again, what happens if either of those lines open up? If you look, we have 300 amps and 400 amps. If I were to open up the line one circuit, the maximum current that neutral could potentially see is 400 amps. So 400 amps now becomes our 
maximum unbalanced load. The reason we need to find the maximum unbalanced load is to move on to step two, right? So we'll just go back to our original 500 amps to work with that. So that was just to highlight what happens if we do have an unbalanced, right? So it's still, again, just based off of the highest of those 220 volt loads. That's the maximum that neutral could potentially see. So we'll reconnect all of our circuit here and we'll put our 500 load back in on both of these. So step two, step one was determine the maximum unbalanced load. And I'm just going to sidebar here for a second. Even if I were to take another load and fire it on, say another 240 volt load, just hypothetically speaking, let's say we stuck a 200 amp load on there, right? The maximum unbalanced load would not change. My line conductors would now see 700 amps. But if I was to, again, open up one of these, let's say I opened up line one, well, now we're no longer supplying our 200 amp load because it's essentially open circuited. This would then go back to 500 amps. And I would again see 500 amps flowing back on my neutral, right? So again, even though we added a 240 volt load that drew more current down my lines, the maximum unbalanced load did not change because again, it is the maximum load from those 120 volt uh, sources that you're gonna see on that circuit. So we'll just get rid of that so it's not confusing things. So back to our 500 amp loads. So step two. Step two. Now we're going to actually determine what can we apply a demand to. So 4018 actually tells me what I cannot apply a demand factor to. If I have any portion of this circuit that is discharge lighting, that would be your fluorescent lighting, things like that, where you're using a transformer inside, um, nothing can be demanded on discharge lighting. So if there was any portion of this, I would simply subtract it from the 500. So I'm going to start with we need to do, we're going to start with our 500 amps. Okay, then we're going to subtract out anything that we can't apply a demand to. We're not going to just completely ignore it. It's just anything we can't apply a demand factor to, we want to keep it 100%. So we're going to take it out before we apply the demand factor. The other thing that I want to look around for is any type of non-linear loading. That could be computers, servers, VFDs, anything like that, that is going to introduce harmonics into the circuit. We need to keep that portion also at 100%. And that's specifically if I have a three-phase four-wire system. For example, a 12208 or something like that, I cannot apply a demand factor to any portion that is non-linear loading from a three-phase four-wire system. So in this circuit, for example, we don't have any non-linear loads. And besides that, it's a 12240 volt. We also don't have any electric discharge lighting. So we don't have to worry about those first two. But it then tells me that I'm also not allowed to, or really it says, I can apply a demand factor to anything in excess of 200 amps, bearing in mind those first two items that we talked about, right? So in that example, what we're going to do, we're going to go 500 amps, we're going to subtract out the 200 amps that it tells me I can't touch. Inadvertently, that's what they're saying. They're saying the first 200 amps of this unbalanced load is untouchable. We can't do anything with it. We need to keep it at 200%. So we subtract it out and we're left with 300 amps. This is what I can apply a demand factor to. This is what I can apply a demand to. So we're going to do that. We're going to apply the demand and the demand factor for a reduced neutral for any portion that I'm allowed to is 70%. So we're going to multiply that by 0.7 and I'm left with 210 amps for the portion that I am allowed to apply demand factor. Now remember we subtracted out the 200 because we didn't want to touch it. We wanted to keep it at 100% which means we need to add it back into our equation. So we're going to take the 200 that we subtracted out and we're going to add it right back into there which gives me a total of 410 amps. We started with 500 amps and we are allowed to reduce the 300 amp portion of that which leaves us with 410 amps overall which if I was to go and size my conductors in this example I could use table 2 and because we're over 
100 amps, 4-006 sub rule 2 says if we don't know the termination temperature, we can assume 75 degrees if we're over 100 amps. Table 2, 75, we're going to say these are my ungrounded conductors or my hot conductors. Right, we're going to go table 2, 75 degrees, we end up with a 900 kc mil. That's for our hots. Our grounded conductor or our neutral conductor in this example, we're going to do the same thing. Table 2, again, we can assume that's 75 degrees because it's over that 100 amp mark from 4006 sub rule 2. And I end up with a 600 kc mil. So again, you can see there's a reduction in size on that neutral conductor because of the allowance for any portion above 200 amps. If we were doing a question that incorporated discharge lighting, we would do the exact same thing. So the next example, we're going to work on the exact same thing. So in this next example, if you notice at the bottom of the circuit, I've added in 100 amps of discharge lighting. We're going to use the same numbers here, but we're going to work with that 100 amps of discharge lighting and see how it changes the question and see if it changes the size of that neutral conductor after that demand factor has been applied. So we're going to start out with the same thing that we did last time. We're going to start out with our maximum unbalanced load of 500 amps because that hasn't changed. Again, we know that we can't touch the first 200, so we're going to subtract that out right away. We also know that we can't touch any portion that is discharge lighting, so we're going to subtract out that 100 amps as well. And what we're left with now is 200 amps that I can actually apply the demand of 70% to. So we're going to do that. We're going to go times 0.7. We're left with 140 amps. Now, Remember again, we've taken this portion out of the circuit so that when we apply the demand, it doesn't touch those. We want to keep those at 100%. So we're going to add those right back in. We're going to add in our 100 amps and we're going to add back in our 200 amps. So if we add back in our 100 and we add back in our 200 here, we end up with a total of 440 amps. This number again, I can go table two. And again, I can assume 75 degrees because 4006 sub rule 2 tells me over 100 amps, I can assume a 75 degree termination temperature. Table 2, 75 degrees. If this is my ungrounded, again, we'll start with our hot. So exactly the same as we did last time. Table 2, 75 degrees. Nothing has changed for our hot. It's still a 900 kc mil. But for our grounded conductor, we go to table 2 in the 75 degree column and remember this 440 amps that's now the minimum ampacity for my neutral conductor after the demand this leaves us with a 700 kc mil so we still have a reduction in size in that neutral conductor but because of the discharge lighting it's not as much of a reduction in size so hopefully this has helped you walking yourself through downsizing your neutral conductor calculation Feel free to smash that like button. Feel free to hit that subscribe button and notify yourself with the bell so that you can see the next video that comes out. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.